Hello and welcome to another of our video services from St Luke's in Greyshot. My name's Jeremy Haswell and I'm the vicar here. This is the 28th of February and we are in the season of Lent. And there is a series of sermons which we are following, building up uh, what it feels like and what it is like and what the Bible says about having a healthy heart. I have, uh, to begin with, a few notices that I'd love, love to share. And uh, the first one is that we have a number of roles which need to be filled uh, in the running and the administration of the church. And the first one is that we need a second church warden. Edward has been working brilliantly on his own, but really he does need somebody else to help with some aspects of the running of the church. And of course, every church warden brings their own strengths to the job. Um, and if you want to find out more about the job, then there are details on the website and you can speak to Sheila Austin, who has both been one and is also our PCC secretary. Secondly, we need four new PCC members who will start uh, in April at the APCM, the, the annual parochial church meeting. And uh, two of those four will be those who are appointed as Deanery Synod members. And that means that they will go to the Deanery Synod, which is a meeting uh, of representatives from the local 10 churches, and they will report back to the PCC on those meetings. And finally, in the roles section, we really do need a stewardship recorder. And what we mean by that is somebody who keeps a track on the regular giving of the church. We're blessed to have a, a serious amount of income that comes from uh, regular giving, and that needs to be tracked. And we need somebody who will really enjoy the job of uh, watching that and also applying for the gift aid, which also help, helps with our income. Uh, details of that are on the website and also if you want to speak to Viv Ward, our treasurer, then please do either contact me or if you know his contact details, contact him. Thank you. Also, we have the annual parochial church meeting coming up, which I just mentioned in that previous notice. And so do keep your eyes peeled for any notices about that. Then I just want to mention this book, which I have recommended um, for the Lent series and uh, it's called A Cross in the Heart of God and its subtitle is Reflections on the Death of Jesus and it's by uh, Reverend Samuel Wells. Uh, Sam Wells is the vicar of St Martin in the Fields in London and uh, can often be heard on the Radio 4 uh, Thought for the Day programme and is sometimes interviewed for other things. And I noticed that uh, they also, he also ran the, um, the, the appeal, uh, the Christmas appeal uh, on Radio 4 as well. I have been finding this book an absolute thrill and a joy. It takes us deep into preparing for Easter and for Good Friday. And it speaks of the heart of God. And it speaks absolutely lyrically and wonderfully about the Trinity and uh, there, is, there are deep things in it for us all. Um, it's structured brilliantly for us and also has some study notes at the back. And uh, if anybody wants to discuss those study notes, uh, then uh, we can arrange for that to happen as well. Also, tomorrow is Kay Hulin's funeral at 10 o'clock. Uh, it is, in fact, just a private funeral, of course, because of the restrictions of the COVID rules. Um, so it's mainly just family members who are present. Please do pray for me and for the family and friends who are missing Kay so much. Kay, of course, was the one of the, one of the founders of the PK nursery and so has touched so many lives in the village and has been so appreciated. So now we're going to move on to the rest of the service and I'm going to read and pray the Collect for this Sunday. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, you show to those who are in error the light of your truth, that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant to all those who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion, that they may reject those things that are contrary to their profession and follow all such things as are agreeable to the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A wonderful prayer that God might lead all of us into his righteousness. And so now we move on to our first of two readings. Thank you. The reading is taken from Romans 4, verses 13 to 25. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God, in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Then he began to tell them about the terrible things he would suffer, and that he would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the other Jewish leaders, and be killed, and that he would rise again three days afterwards. He talked about it quite frankly with them. So Peter took him aside and chided him. You shouldn't say things like that, he told Jesus. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples and then said to Peter very sternly, Satan, get behind me. You are looking at this only from a human point of view and not from God's. Then he called his disciples and the crowds to come over and listen. If any of you wants to be my follower, he told them, you must put aside your own pleasures and shoulder your cross and follow me closely. If you insist on saving your life, you will lose it. Only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know, know what it means to really live. And how does a man benefit if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the process? For is there anything worth more than his soul? And anyone who is ashamed of me and my message in these days of unbelief and sin, 
I, the Messiah, will be ashamed of him when I return in the glory of my Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for those readings. And now the talk on the subject uh, of those two readings. And the theme that I want to look at today is that phrase in Mark's Gospel where it says, Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. So this is all about our hearts. And the theme of the whole uh, series in Lent is about developing and maintaining a healthy heart so that we might follow God, that we might do God's will and follow his ways. We've looked at the integrity of the heart at one stage. We've looked at the provision of God to heal our broken hearts. We've looked at the love of the Father. Uh, and we've looked at the glory of Jesus uh, through the transfiguration. All of this is about our hearts being capable and free and full to serve the Lord. Now the Bible uses the word heart primarily to refer to that part of us which is the ruling center, the whole being. And in the Middle Ages the, it was thought to be in our bellies and that's where we get uh, the phrase lingering on which is that person has really got guts to do such and such. In other words, it's talking about character, it's talking about courage, it's talking about the nature of our being and the strength of our will perhaps to uh, follow through on something that is difficult. The heart, the will, the intellect, the feelings, these are all part of what is the heart and soul of a person. Heart and soul, of course, in Scripture can, in fact, be almost interchanged. People can be described as hard-hearted, soft-hearted, and so on. And we're familiar with all of this language, and most of us will be very familiar with the idea of a heart. And we talk about it. And, of course, it's poetic, poetic language. And the, the reason um, I even mention it is that really... There are some people who struggle with this concept of the heart because it's so key to understanding faith uh, and that we are actually applying our heart to be full of faith and, and our courage is all interwoven with that. Romans chapter 4 talks about Abraham and it, it's, it's talking about Abraham's faith and how faith impacted on the way in which um, Abraham related to God. The promise that is mentioned in this passage about Abraham is that Abraham was going to become a huge family. Now we know that we see the offspring of Abraham all around the Middle East, and in fact all around the world. In other words, God kept his promise. But to really understand this passage and what it means and what it meant for Abraham, we have to go back to that time before the promise was actually fulfilled. And uh, what it says in the passage is that um, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. That the promise came to those who believed. It didn't come, as it says in the passage, by the efforts or the, the works uh, or, or the efforts of Abraham. It came because he had faith. It came because he trusted the one who was able to keep the promise. Now, of course, it wasn't all at once, and I think sometimes we struggle with this concept of faith and we consider ourselves not to be very strong in faith. But actually Jesus is calling each one of us, Jew and Gentile, to grow in faith. That 
whether we are a Jewish believer in the Messiah or whether we are a Gentile or a non-Jew coming to faith in Christ, every one of us is being called to grow in faith and to understand that this faith is the, is the essence and the access that we have to the promise of God being fulfilled. The lesson for Abraham was that Abraham himself was not to be the one to fix it for God. He tried to, and uh, the problem was that he knew at the time that it was impossible. And it says here very clearly in the scripture that he uh, was as good as dead, in the sense that he was over 100, and Sarah had, was well past the age of childbearing. And yet, God said, you're going to have children. And these were children of the promise. Ishmael, of course, was the promise, was, the, was a child of the human will. And then Isaac came as a miracle child. It really shouldn't have happened by human logic. It is faith that impresses God. And it's a heart of faith that is able to receive the gift of God. The passage, the passage opens by strongly stating that through keeping of rules, it is no one receives the promise. In other words, it's by the law, no one receives the promise. But it is the childlike trust in the Father that opens the door to everything else. We can't earn our salvation. We can't earn the promise of God. But actually we receive it by yielding our hearts and trusting him and believing that he who promised is able to perform what he has promised. Abraham and his offspring received the promise. And then it says that Abraham, because of that faith, was considered righteous. Now what this leads us to understand is that faith and right standing with God is a translation of righteousness. It's all about relationship. Faith and, and our relationship with God are interwoven. And of course that makes sense because you have to have faith in something or in God. And that is a relationship. That is a conversation. Because there's a conversation to give us the promise and then there's the faith to trust in the promise. And that is all about a wonderful, intimate connection. We're called to live a life of faith, not box-ticking legalism. Uh, it says that if keeping the law made us right with God, then faith would have no value at all. And of course, this was the basis upon which Martin Luther, a monk, came to understand that it's by faith that we're saved, not by works. So you can't buy it, you can't buy forgiveness, you can't do things to kind of get God's attention, but it's by faith. And so therefore the key is to understand what a heart full of faith looks like. And I want to say that it, the, this passage about Abraham is really helpful to teach us what a heart of faith really looks like. And it was all about the moment that Abraham realized that it was utterly impossible for him to fix it. And that was when his heart turned to trust and to faith. Talking about faith can be difficult. And, and it's generally difficult because we have a tendency to judge and to measure faith, like enough faith or strong enough faith. And of course, Jesus himself talked about uh, not having much faith. And they didn't see much because there was not much faith. But actually, 
God is in the process of growing our hearts and growing our capacity for faith to trust him because he wants to reveal more of himself to us. And this is the growth and the maturity of us as disciples. And of course, this then leads us on to the gospel reading from Mark chapter 8. Jesus had set his face towards the cross, towards Jerusalem and his own death. And now was the time to begin to tell the disciples about his own death. And Peter starts to do a remarkable thing and rebuke Jesus. He still hadn't learnt that it was an idiotic thing to do uh, and it was not something uh, that was appropriate. And then, of course, Jesus says to him, but then Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And what this was talking about was immaturity in Peter. Peter had not grasped that faith and walking with Jesus and being a disciple was all about trusting the Father's purposes, the Father's will, and doing those things which pleased God, not what pleased us. Because, of course, Peter was very naturally just saying, actually, we want you to stay with us. This is one of those moments when the spiritual and the human come together and Jesus addressed an attitude in Peter that was actually born of Satan. There was a spirit that was driving Peter to question Jesus' uh, determination to go to the cross. And it was a completely human thing and it was a human attitude. But the source of it was spiritual. And Jesus identified and put his finger on it and said, this has come from Satan. Satan, get behind me. Some of you may remember Joan Houchin. She used to sit at the back of church with Kitty. And Joan was uh, having tea with us on one occasion. And she said uh, that this passage was something that she was taught as a child in primary school. And what she was told was that sometimes in life you feel that there's an opposition to something in life and it doesn't feel right. And she was taught that if you say get behind me, Satan, then you will know whether that is a spiritual opposition to what you are doing because the way will be cleared. And so she learnt this and she said to us that actually that had really made a difference at some very, well, a lot of times in her life. It had really made a difference. And so she'd learnt as a child to walk by faith in trusting that she as a child of God, was able to say what Jesus said. Get behind me, Satan. And actually, there are times where we need to do that. And I want to preach, as it were, Joan Hatchin's sermon. She was wonderful, and she's gone to be with the Lord now. But Joan was uh, very practical about this, and it was very straightforward and simple. Her childlike faith in God as a, as a small child, actually touched and informed her whole life. Then Jesus goes on to say some amazing things. He said, when, the, when he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, then he called the crowd together, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And this is where the heart comes in again. Denying ourselves, denying ourselves on the throne and the ruling of our own hearts. And what that looks like is that we put Jesus on the throne of our hearts. So it's not about what we want, it's about what he wants. And of course Jesus supremely showed that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will be done. And so what we see is that taking up our cross daily and following him is all about putting him on the throne of our lives and on our hearts. And then, it's, then he goes on to say, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. 
This means spending our lives to follow Jesus. So it gives us a definition of a disciple, of someone who's chosen to deny themselves and serve Jesus, the vision and the kingdom of God. Someone who serves the king of love and grows in their life to look more and more like him and through practice and an open heart do more and more of his will. This is a choice that we make. The burden that Jesus gives us is not backbreaking. Remember, he said, my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is all about establishing our heart. And Abraham, having a heart full of faith, received the promise. And Jesus is talking about that. Lose your life and you gain it. And that is the promise, both of eternal life and a life here that is touched by eternity. These work together. And the characteristic, characteristic of God's promise is that he wants to do big things through you, through us here at St. Luke's, and through his church. Obedience and yieldedness and an attitude of willingness to completely depend on God is the key to walking the way of the cross. Amen. And so now we're going to go to our intercessions that are led by Claire. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you that this is the day that you have made. We choose to rejoice in your love, in your goodness and in your favour towards us. In spite of every situation and circumstance, we hand you every burden today and declare that you are the Lord over all and that nothing is too difficult for you. We worship you and magnify your name, looking to you in your glory to supply every need and heal our wounded hearts, that our hearts may sing again, touched by your grace and filled with your love. We put our trust in you for all that we face privately, in our families, in our communities, as a nation and as a world. We pray for the government and all the scientists and advisers seeking to find a good course in the complexities of society, that they would have wisdom and courage as we begin to move out of this phase of the lockdown. We thank you for the vaccination programme and the effort to supply vaccines for the world. We ask you for a good response to the vaccine rollout and pray for a wide uptake. We pray for our economy nationally. We ask for your help and your encouragement to Rishi Sunak with the budget. Help them make good and wise decisions. We pray for the bishops and archbishops especially our own Bishop Andrew and Joe, the archdeacons, area deans, ministers and all those who work to support the work of the diocese. We pray for the Queen and the royal family, in particular Prince Philip, that they would all know your grace at this time. We thank you for the constant example of service and duty shown by the Queen over so many years. Be near to them and bring your comfort and healing. We pray for wisdom for our local leaders and protection for the village and our surroundings. For our local businesses, we ask that they may know your mercy for the service businesses and hospitality premises, the catering and all other businesses strained to the limit. For those self-employed who have lost work and for those who are struggling to survive, having lost their jobs and stressed by the extended restrictions, we pray for them to have access to the support they need to bridge the gap. For the isolated, the lonely and the sick, we pray for your presence to be with them and for all of us to be inspired to support and encourage them. We pray for Greyshot Primary School and Mrs Pritchard the head teacher and the leaders of PK Nursery and our private schools in the parish, 
that they would have the strength to prepare for a return to school and flourish in the task of educating our children. We pray for our own youth and children and for the young people in the village, that they would reach out to you and know your love as the antidote to loneliness and frustration. We pray for the Youth Alpha run by Dan, that you would inspire the participants to grow in faith and courage to share their lives with others in the group. We thank you for the extraordinary response to the Vicar's Relief Fund and pray for those who have been helped by donations. We pray for all those who grieve, especially the friends and family of Kay Hulin, a founder of PK Nursery in the village, and a light and inspiration to so many, and for her funeral service tomorrow. Grant all who miss her your comfort in their hearts. We give thanks for her life and her faith and pray that her legacy will continue to grow. And for ourselves, we welcome you to cleanse and train our hearts to trust you more and more as we walk by faith and carry your easy yoke and your light burden, following in your footsteps day by day. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for those prayers. And now we're going to continue with the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we have our confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We're truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God our Father and of his Son Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you and goodbye.